Hello beautiful people of the internet, how are you doing tonight? My name is Jackie and welcome back to my channel. So, today in this video, I'm going to be talking about Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 2, entitled A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. And, wow, I don't even know where to begin this episode. I am filming it like literally right after it aired. I'm sorry I'm sitting on my bedroom floor, it's probably not the best angle, but my phone is like, needs to be charged desperately. And I don't even know where to begin with this episode because I loved it. There were so many amazing moments. It was, it was great. It was, it was really good. I'm so excited. Once again, I feel like it was over way too soon. It went by so fast for me, but next episode is going to be the really, really long one, over 80 minutes. So I'm so hyped. And this episode just made me feel so many things. It was wonderful. So once again, I don't have notes on the episode. It's really hard to watch and also tweet and then take notes on top of that. So I'm gonna have to read a handy dandy recap of the episode just to go through chronological order and tell you all my thoughts about this wonderful episode, which was great. I loved it. I can't even say how much I loved it. So many great things happened in this episode. Let's just dive right into it. So we start off this episode with Jamie on trial of sorts now that he's arrived at Winterfell with uh, Daenerys, Sansa, and Jon sitting at the head table and Daenerys is talking about how growing up she always heard about the man who murdered her father from her brother and how is she supposed to trust Jaime when Cersei gave them her word and backed out of it. And even though I think that Jamie was totally right to do what he did to the Mad King, and he was actually a hero for it, I could also understand why Daenerys is not ready to trust him, because he did break his oath, and if she doesn't know the full circumstances, then I can understand why she would think he's not trustworthy. However, Tyrion does come to Jamie's defense and points out, you know, Jamie did still come here by himself, knowing that that would get him in so much trouble with Cersei, though Daenerys is still mad at Tyrion because of all the bad decisions that he's been making and doesn't really want to hear it. And Sansa initially is not Team Jaime either because she knows that Jaime tried to fight her father way back in season one. Well, not tried to fight. He did fight Ned. And it didn't end so well for Ned after that. So Sansa is not exactly a big Jamie fan either. Bran does say to Jamie the things I do for love. So Jamie knows that Bran remembers Jamie pushing him. However, Bran does not say anything to anyone else about how Jamie pushed him. So then the moment that we've all been waiting for, at least that I have been waiting for, Brienne stands up for Jamie and says that she trusts him. She has seen that he is an honorable person. He did save her from being raped, losing his own hand in the process. And because Sansa trusts Brienne, she knows that Brienne would never lie to her. She begrudgingly agrees that Jamie can stay and fight with them if that's what Brienne wants. And when Daenerys asks John for his opinion, he says we need every man we can get. However, Daenerys is really confused about why Jon is being so standoffish with her. And obviously we know it's because of the reveal that he got at the end of last episode. And honestly, it rings true for me with Jon's character that he was gonna sit on this by himself for a while. I mean, it's definitely going to be a lot to process with him, finding out basically his entire life has been a lie and you know that he is sleeping with his aunt. Though I don't think the incest thing is as big a deal in Westeros. I'm sure there's precedent for it. There are am examples in the books of um, uncle-niece marriages. Also Prince Aemon Targaryen married his half-aunt Jocelyn Baratheon, so I don't know how much the incest thing is gonna play a role. And honestly, if like Jon or Daenerys are really icked out by the fact that they were related, I don't think it would really make sense given the world they're living in, but that's just my opinion. Then Arya goes to check up on Gendry and his progress in making her weapon. And I love this scene. I love sassy Arya. She is great. She wants to know what the White Walkers are like since Gendry fought them before. He is concerned about Arya fighting. You know, she has, she's fearless and she has experience, but he says that the White Walkers are like nothing that anyone's ever seen before. However, Arya is uh, proving to him that she can hold her own and um, I love her picking up the dragonglass daggers and throwing them at the pillar and just hitting like perfect on target with everyone like 
<laughs> Kendry looked terrified but also in awe and honestly that's how I feel every time I look at Arya Stark too. I, I love my tiny badass. That is my girl. I absolutely adore her. And you know, hey, that weapon is his priority now after that. So <laughs> Arya got what she wanted. Then we see Jaime go to find Bran in the Godswood. And this was a scene that I was not expecting to get. And I really loved it. Jaime apologizes to Bran for what he did. However, Bran is not mad at him because now they are where they're supposed to be. He is the Three-Eyed Raven and Jaime is here to help them, which is why he is not going to tell anyone about what Jaime did. And I just really liked the scene. I really liked this moment. It was a very adult conversation between the two of them and it was nice to see this genuine remorse from Jamie because man I just love his character arc and his character growth it is great then Jamie and Tyrion have a conversation in the courtyard about Cersei Tyrion asks is Cersei really pregnant and Jamie says she is I mean I think she's pregnant but like my initial thought the very first time I watched that scene was that she wasn't she was lying but I don't know. I want to say she wasn't lying. She genuinely believed she was pregnant at the time, at the very least, but we'll see how it plays out. Last scene, Cersei's episode, Cersei's scene, last episode, sorry, I can't talk, of her drinking wine and like getting teary eyed after having sex with Euron made me a little bit confused. So we'll see how this plays out. We didn't see any Cersei in the episode at all, actually, which. I don't think I realized that, that we didn't see her until right now, <laughs> but we didn't see her at all this episode. I absolutely love how as Jamie and Tyrion are talking, Jamie walks off to the other side of the ramparts to go stare at Brienne, his bay. God, I ship them so hard. So he goes to talk to Brienne, who is training some men, including Podrick, who has greatly improved in his battle skills, though Brienne still only says, eh, he's all right. And she asks Jamie, you know, what are you doing here? And Jamie pauses and says that he knows he's not as good a fighter as he once was, but it would be an honor to serve under Brienne in battle. And this is when I started having heart palpitations. This was such a genuine tender moment. And like Jamie sounded more humble than I think we've ever heard him. And Brienne like clearly doesn't know how to respond to this. And I was just flailing because I love Brienne and Jamie. I love their relationship. I love their interactions. And wow, this made me feel some type of way, guys. So then Jorah seeks out Daenerys and tells Daenerys that Tyrion is a really smart person. And even though Jorah always wanted to be her hand, he thinks that Tyrion is the best person for the job and that she should forgive him. Then Daenerys has a conversation with the Sansa. And this scene, I loved it. I want Sansa and Daenerys to be gal pals so bad. I think they both are very similar as characters and I would love to see them have some kind of friendship or respect for each other. And we're not quite at them being besties yet, but I would say this scene is progress. So Sansa and Daenerys sit down in the library to talk and um, they agree that um, they never should have trusted Cersei. Um, Dana Daenerys says that Tyrion never should have trusted her and Sansa says that Daenerys never should have either and she really wants to know how Daenerys feels about Jon and Daenerys gives a very genuine answer that she loves and trusts Jon my heart and that she did divert her quest for the Iron Throne to be here and to help him. I actually love Daenerys acknowledging in this scene how similar her and Sansa are because I think these two characters have both been through so much and they have had so much amazing character growth which is why I want to see them be friends or at the very least have respect for each other and they do touch each other's hands in this scene which was like yes 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 amazing loved it however things turn a little icy again when Sansa brings up the topic of independence from the north which Daenerys is not too keen on however before she can respond they are interrupted and it turns out that Theon has arrived at Winterfell to help everyone and Sansa gives him a huge hug she looks very touched and later in this episode we see uh, Sansa and Theon eating together and there's no dialogue in this scene but I'm just wondering is Theon in love with Sansa? I just got that impression from the interactions between them we saw in this episode and I'm 
interesting. I don't know what to make of that. Did you guys see like any romantic tensions on Theon's part in this scene? Because I was kind of picking up on it a little bit and I don't know how I feel about that. So we see a cute scene where Davos is giving food to some of the men and women who have come to fight for them and Gilly is talking to the women who will be staying in the crypts during the battle as Gilly and Little Sam will be doing and there is this little girl who initially wants to fight and oh, this was such an emotional moment because this girl has some kind of scar on her face and I could just tell that when Davos was looking at this feisty little girl he was thinking about Shireen and oh, I am emotional and ultimately Gilly convinces the little girl to go down in the crypts saying you know my son and I would really appreciate having you down there to protect us and wow this was absolutely adorable. I felt all the feels great. So next Tormund, Beric, Dolores, Ed, and the Men of the Night's Watch arrive back from Last Hearth and Tormund greets Jon with a big man hug. I love Tormund. He is great comic relief for this show and he lets Jon know that the dead are on their way and they will be there before the sun rises tomorrow which means that this could be everyone's last night alive. And then Tormund asks, is the big lady still here? Which... I don't ship Tormund and Brienne. I'm a brainy girl at heart, but Tormund is funny. I will give him that. He is hilarious. I'm so glad he's still alive. At least, at least for this episode. <laughs> so next there is a strategy session between a whole bunch of characters. I don't even remember everyone who's at this scene where Jon says that they need to take out the Night King if they want to defeat the army of the dead. And Bran says that the Night King is after him. So he is willing to wait in the God's wood and lure the Night King there because since he was touched by the Night King, the Night King now knows where he is at all times. And basically his logic is that he is the Night King's target because the Night King wants to eradicate humanity. He wants to take away personhood and the Three-Eyed Raven holds memories of the entire human existence. So that is a threat to him. And I knew, I knew Bran was the target. I knew it. I'm just wondering, is there something more complicated to the Night King's motivations other than he just wants to take over humanity and make them into White Walkers? I don't know. I would like to see if there is a deeper motivation to the Night King's character other than him just being a horrible villain who is here to kill everyone. And then we have an amazing moment where Theon says that he and the Ironborn will stay in the Godswood and protect Bran, which I absolutely love because Theon did take Winterfell from Bran and Rickon and he wanted to kill them. He would have killed them if he had been able to find them. So this is a great moment in Theon's redemption arc for me. And now I'm wondering what's going to happen. Is Theon going to die like trying to save Bran's life? Oh my god, I don't know. But I just absolutely loved this moment. I love Theon's redemption storyline. It's, it's great. I never even considered this as a possibility that Theon would be protecting Bran, but it makes so much sense and I love it. So then there's a really sad little scene where these two girls run away from Asande because racism and xenophobia. The Northerners really have never seen any person of color before and they're scared by it really which is really sad but an unfortunate reality in our real world and so then Grey Worm comes up to her and says that he wants to fight for Daenerys until she has her throne but after that Westeros will not be a place for them and that he is willing to go with Missandei anywhere that she wants to go. Missandei says that she misses Noth her homeland and she would like to go back there so Grey Worm promises that he will take her there and protect her and you guys I love Grey Worm and Masande. I love their romance. I ship them but I don't think they are ever making it to Noth and I would not be surprised if Grey Worm is killed next episode. I hate to say it but I think it might happen and I'm preparing myself for the worst.
Then we have a scene between John, Sam, and Dolores Ed on the battlements with a brief appearance from Ghost, which made me so happy. See, Game of Thrones writers, was it really that hard to just throw in a little ghost cameo? That's all I wanted, just to know that that boy is still around and kicking. And oh god, if the show has him die this season, that would just be awful. Like, it's bad enough when the characters die. It's even worse when it's the dire wolves. Then we have Tyrion and Jaime drinking together. There is a funny moment where Tyrion says that he wishes their father Tywin was still alive and Jaime says why and Tyrion says because he would I want to see the look on his face if he knew that his sons were going to die defending Winterfell which was great. Then Brienne and Pod join them and Tyrion convinces them to stay and have some drinks with them. <laughs> Brienne is such like she's like Podrick's mom, she tells him he can have half a glass, which Tyrion, of course, then films fills to the brim. It was great. I love it. Then Davos and Tormund arrive, and Tormund is trying to make the moves on Brienne, though Brienne's not really feeling it. It was really funny. He tells the story about how he got the nickname Giant's Bane, claiming that he killed a giant and then, um, nursed the giant's wife for several months, which is classic torment. Tyrion says he thinks they have a chance to survive talking about all the amazing things that each person there has done, but then the group realizes that Brienne is not a knight because women can't be knights. Tormund says if he was a king he would knight Brienne, but Jaime says you don't have to be a king to knight someone, you just have to be a knight yourself, so he is going to knight Brienne. And I loved this moment. It was everything I could have asked for. I actually did know that this scene was going to happen as well as the little Arya and Gendry scene that came later because apparently Amazon Germany accidentally released the episode early and I saw these spoilers on Tumblr not realizing they were spoilers. So I spent literally all day today even at Easter dinner with my family thinking about Jamie knighting Brienne and Arya and Gendry well, we'll get to that. <laughs> so now, even though I ship Jamie and Brienne so much, I don't know if their relationship and the love they have for each other, which I do believe they do love each other in some way, is ever going to become physical or sexual. So this moment of Jamie knighting Brienne was just absolutely amazing to me because it had so much emotion and so much great romantic tension almost like a romantic chemistry even in such a simple moment because I just love the journey these two characters have been on together and I love the respect they have for each other and it was amazing to see Brienne be so touched. My mom and I started clapping on the couch when uh, Jamie told her to rise as Sir Brienne of Tarth, a knight of the Seven Kingdoms where the title of the episode comes from and then everybody else in the room starts clapping too. Yay Brienne! That is my girl. I am so proud of her. Her. On a sadder note, I have to say, I feel like Podrick's dying next episode. I, I, I feel it. And um, I'm not happy about it. Obviously, I don't want anyone to die. But the fact of the matter is some people going are going to and I think Podrick is gonna be one. Hey guys, so editing Jackie here. I am back at college and as I was editing this video I realized I didn't mention that A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms is also a reference to the Tales of Duncan Egg stories about Sir Duncan the Tall who is actually Brienne's ancestor and I think it's also interesting that the song they chose to have Podrick sing in this episode is Jenny's song which is sort of connected to Sir Duncan as well because Jenny of Old Stones was the wife to Prince Duncan Targaryen who was named after Dunk. He was the son of Aegon V and it's connected to the whole tragedy at Summer Hall where Dunk died. And I began to think if this is some sort of foreshadowing for what's going to happen at Winterfell next episode. I do now believe that everyone is going to have to f flee Winterfell, so maybe Winterfell will be set ablaze much akin to Summer Hall and it will have a resulting tragedy. And it's also kind of interesting to think about the names Winterfell and Summer Hall. They are very similar. 
Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming now. So Arya goes to find the Hound who is sitting out on the battlements and the Hound says he can't believe that she's not talking because she never used to shut up and Arya says that she has changed. She asks the Hound why he is even in the North because she's never known him to fight for anyone but himself. To which the Hound says, I fought for you, didn't I? And wow, when I started watching Game of Thrones season one, did I ever expect to have such emotional feelings about a scene between Arya and the Hound? No, I used to hate the Hound, and now I absolutely love this weird relationship that he and Arya have. I don't think either the Hound or Arya are people who really tell other people their feelings. I think both of them sort of close themselves off as a defense mechanism. So these rare moments where their respect for each other seeps out are moments that I really like and that I think are really in character for both of them. Then Beric joins them and Arya is not very happy to see him. The Hound asks, wasn't he on your list too? And Arya says he was for a time. I'm kind of confused about why exactly Arya decided she was gonna take Beric, Thoros, and Melisandre off her list. Um, it never really was explained in the show, but evidently she did at some point because that's what she says. And so Beric sits down, but Arya says she is not going to spend her potential last few hours alive with either of them. And this is where we get to the Arya and Gendry scene that I was talking about earlier. And man, do I have feelings. <laughs> So we have a scene with Arya and Gendry where Gendry gives her her now completed weapon that she requested. I think it's like a spear or a shaft that has dragon glass on both ends. It's something that we saw her wielding in the preview for the season. So I think we're definitely going to see her use this weapon against the White Walkers next episode. Now Arya ends up finding out that Gendry is Robert Baratheon's bastard son and that's why Melisandre wanted him. And they don't really dwell on this, like, at all. I figured they would, like, at least talk a little bit more about this, this revelation that, oh my god, Gendry's a Baratheon bastard, the only member of his family still alive. But uh, we kind of move on from that quickly, so that's all right. And then um, they talk about Melisandre and her seduction. I would call it more of an assault of Gendry and Arya asks him if that was his first time and he says in true Gendry fashion yeah it was I'd never had leeches put on me before oh god bless him god bless that boy so Arya wants to know how many women Gendry has slept with which he admits reluctantly was three and basically Arya has decided that if this is her last night alive and she might die tomorrow, she doesn't want to die a virgin and she wants to have sex before she possibly dies with Gendry. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know like what to say. This was, when I saw the spoiler on Tumblr this morning, I was speechless quite like I am right now. Because I was not expecting this at all. Going into this season, I shipped Arya and Gendry, but I didn't want to believe that there was a chance they could ever become canon. I did not want to get my hopes up. I did, thought I'd be lucky to get a kiss between them. And not only did they kiss, they had sex. <laughs> I'm still shook. I'm still shook. I know some people on Twitter did not really like this scene and I get it because we've been watching Maisie Williams since she was very very young but you know it's acting, it's part of the job, and honestly it could have been much more explicit than it actually was so personally I really didn't have a problem with it. You know she didn't want to die a virgin, Arya was gonna go after what she wanted, and you know respect girl, Gendry's a fine man. I actually really like how on a show with so much sexual violence where so many female characters have lost their virginities in a horrible way where Daenerys and Sansa both were raped the first time um, it was nice to see a female character take control of a sexual situation and have a consensual sex scene with a female character taking the lead. Personally, I appreciated that. I mean, <laughs> I get why some people might be uncomfortable with it, but in the show, Arya is 18. She's an adult, both in our society and in Westerosa society, and Kendry's only four years older than her, which is not really that big a deal. And I mean... 
yeah, I guess it's kind of awkward with Maisie and Joe, but it's acting. It's part of the job. Now, when I first saw the spoiler that they were going to consummate <laughs> their relationship, I thought for sure that meant Gendry was going to die next week. And I was really upset about it because I never thought I had to be worried about Gendry. I thought for sure he was going to live because he's the last member of House Baratheon. I thought for sure he has to live and be legitimized. And knowing that Arya and Gendry were going to get together so early in the season made me nervous that they were going to kill him next week and that this was their way of making us emotionally invested so that they can devastate us. But now, after watching this scene, I don't know if I feel like Gendry is going to die next week or not. Don't get me wrong. If you love Gendry, if you love Gendria, you should emotionally prepare yourself for the possibility that one or both of them may die. Because it's a possibility. This is Game of Thrones. Could Gendry get killed off next week? Yeah, it's possible. I'm not going to lie and say that I am 100% sure he's going to live. However... The way the scene went down makes me think he's not going to die. Now, if Arya had gone to Gendry and said that she loved him forever and swore her undying devotion and he did the same and then they decided they were going to be together and that led to them making out and having sex, then I would have thought for sure Gendry's dead. But instead, it came across as a I don't want to die a virgin let's do this thing and I feel like why would the writers set it up that way if this is just their way to emotionally devastate us with Yendry's death. I think it makes more storyline sense for them to both live past this battle and have to talk about hey when we thought we were both gonna die we had sex. Maybe we should talk about that. So I feel like if they were going to kill him next week, they wouldn't have done the scene that way. Also, there was a moment where we specifically see Gendry looking at Arya's scars. So that made me wonder if maybe they're going to have a conversation about that, about what they've been through at some point. Basically, I think this scene sets Arya and Gendry up for some conversations they're going to have to have. And I just don't think if they were going to kill Gendry next week, this is how they would have done this scene between them. Now, listen, could Gendry die? Yes, he could. He definitely could get killed off in the Battle of Winterfell. He could get turned into a white and Arya could have to mercy kill him. It's possible. But after watching this scene, I still don't think so. So I'm preparing for the worst, but I still think there is a chance. Then we have a scene with Jorah and Lyanna Mormont, which I absolutely loved. They are cousins. I would have liked to see a longer scene between them, maybe the moment they first see each other again, but I did think this one was good. We see them arguing about whether or not Lyanna is going to fight with her men, and Lyanna Mormont, being the little badass she is, is like, of course I am. So then Sam goes up to Jorah and says that he has Heartsbane, the Tarly family sword, but he is not strong enough to wield it, so he wants Jorah to. And this this is one of my predictions. I thought this was going to happen. So when I knew it was coming, I started like celebrating on the couch. I was like, yeah, I was right. I realized I didn't update you guys last week on how my predictions bingo is going. So I have the free space crossed off, John riding Regal that happened last episode, and now Sam giving Heartsbane to Jorah. Originally right here, I was going to put Arya and Gendry kiss, and then I switched it out for Arya wearing Littlefinger's face, and now I wish I hadn't. But, you know, I still got two, and they're in a row. So, if Melisandre brings the fiery hand, Varys is burned alive for treason, and Bear kisses the last kiss, then I'm golden, because that's all the things I have in that row. Then, at the end of the episode, Daenerys goes to find Jon in the crypts, where he was standing in front of the statue of Lyanna Stark, his mother and Daenerys wants to know why Jon has been so distant from her. So he tells her that he found out he is Rhaegar and Lyanna's true-born son who was given to Ned to raise to protect him from Robert and Daenerys initially doesn't want to believe it and I had a really hard time telling exactly what was going through her mind in this scene. At first she sounded a little angry saying that um this means that he has a claim to the Iron Throne. But then I, I didn't feel like she was entirely mad. I think mad was one of her emotions. But I think, like, I don't think she's going to 
be pissed at John now. I don't think there's going to be a Dance of Dragons 2.0. At least I hope not because I think that would be stupid and not make sense for Daenerys's character and if it did happen I would be really pissed off. I actually wonder if Daenerys may tell Jon, you know, we can't continue our romantic relationship because I can't have children and you are the last hope for the dynasty to continue so you need to marry someone else. I feel like maybe that could happen, though obviously I think Daenerys is going to find out that she's pregnant. I do not believe that she's really infertile. But before we can see any more of this conversation between the two of them, the horn sounds, the dead is approaching, and we see the White Walkers headed towards Winterfell. And that's where the episode ends. <laughs> it went by so quickly and I want more, but I'm also terrified for next week's episode because I think a lot of people I love are gonna die. So guys, that is it for this episode. Who do you think is going to survive the Battle of Winterfell and who do you think is going to die? Do you think they will defeat the dead or do you think they will have to flee? I think the living is going to have to abandon Winterfell and originally I thought they were going to go to Dragonstone, but Yara did mention in episode one that she is going to hold the Iron Islands in case Daenerys needs somewhere to retreat to, so maybe they will go to the Iron Islands. I think that Podrick's probably gonna die next episode. Probably Grey Worm. Let's see who else. I think Jorah's going to die at some point. I don't know if it'll be next episode or not. And I think perhaps Beric could use the last kiss on someone next episode. I think the Hound is the most likely, but you never really know. It could be someone else. Could Gendry die next episode? He could. I hope not but I think I need to emotionally prepare myself for the possibility. He may die. So guys, those are my thoughts on Game of Thrones season eight, episode two, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. I love this episode. It was great and I am so excited and also so nervous for next week's episode. Let me know in the comments, what did you think about this episode? If you liked this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more from me. I will be recapping and reviewing every Game of Thrones episode for the rest of the season. So make sure to tune back in if you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, and I hope to see you in the next video.